Welcome back to Bible and Blues, and we are continuing on with uh, Legion. Um, and you know, I, I, you know, one of you guys mentioned that Legion is uh, not really your cup of tea. Or you don't have FX, and I can, I can appreciate that. Uh, full cable is definitely expensive. I'm, I'm, I've been looking at options, let me tell you. Uh, but um, I mean, it's not like YouTube is paying at this point in time in my career, right? So, but. I did promise that uh, the plot does smooth out, and uh, in this episode, I went in and rewatched because I have watched it before, and I caught a couple of new things, which is, which I'll be able to add in to make, you know give you some more entertainment on value on that. But so in episode two, um, David is in Summerland. Okay, Summerland is um, their hideout, I guess. You know, bear in mind, Division Three is a government entity. They are not, okay? Now, they paint the government entity as all the bad things that we always think of the government being, right? So, if you're a conspiracy theorist, this one is for you, let me tell you, all right? So, um, so we're, we're, we're in Summerland, and he's just arrived, and you have to think that uh, he's in a place with a lot of other gifted mutants, uh, people with lots of power, abilities... So, well, and he's, he, we already know he's a telepath. We already know he's a, he has telepathic abilities. So, we have to consider that uh, with that, he's, um, he's hearing a lot of stuff. And that's one of the reasons he was, he was on, on antipsychotic medications. And, uh, and, you know, schizophrenia is a real thing. You know, it's not, it's not like it's a, a an unknown issue in, in, in our mental ability in our mental issues schizophrenia is real is a real problem for some people and he's been told he's had schizophrenia his whole life so he's hearing all these voices and you know, it's, you know you imagine his fear and his feelings you know welling up in him about this and so uh dr bird melanie uh is is sitting with him and he's you know he's in a bed and you know the beds are kind of bunk style cubby hole bunk style like on a ship so maybe you navy guys would kind of understand this where you know you you just kind of draw a curtain for privacy and that's about all you have and a bunk right so that's where he's you know that's the sleeping arrangements so melanie is is, is with him and he's just freaking out at this point he's having a real tough time so she starts she teaches him how to calm down she teaches him uh you know to focus on the voices because he's which is just total opposite of everything he he learned to do growing up and dealing with this. He was always told, ignore the voices. And now he's being told, listen to him and, and listen, you can hear one voice calling your name. Um, and I'm betting that was probably Sid, uh, doing that and to use and, and to envision a volume knob. And he pulls out a volume knob from a 1970s record player. That'll have more significance later. So, he just sits there and he turns it down. Uh, as he turns it down, uh, the, the voices go out. She says, and just to all you hear is that one voice. And he does it, and it calms him down. He stops hearing all the voices. You know, so, you know, which, which is good, you know. So, okay, so he's calmed down. And it's like the next day he's going to do memory work. Uh, memory work, now, now uh, remember we told you uh, uh, piton pitonomy. I think that's how it's pronounced. Patonomy. <laughs> Uh, is uh, it has the ability to kind of get in and out of memories, right? That he's a, his, he's the memory guy. So they go to this room in the woods. I'm looking at my M my IMDb so I can have names correctly. Um, so they go to this this building in the woods, and essentially, if you've ever watched any tiny homes, it looks kind of like one of those. It's all glass, mirrored outside, and you can see through on the inside. Okay, and it's all you know so. Kind of a cool building and everything, but can you imagine keeping that thing clean in the woods? Yeah, really totally impractical, but whatever. It's a television series. Uh, so, so he, uh, uh, so they're in there and they sit down at this table and I swear this thing was taken. Anybody ever watch Thunderball? Okay, uh, the James Bond movie Thunderball. And where he, you know, sat down across from the guy uh, with, you know, with the playing the game that it, as, as it went, if it got, if you, if you were losing, if you got hit, it would actually give you an electrical shock. 
he had to hold on to the sticks like that. It made me think of that, only it was just more than, you know, more than the two players would be playing. So, I don't know. So, anyway. So, that was, um, uh, you know, kind of the uh, the room they're in. And, and, and I don't, I guess, I don't know the significance of the room, but, uh, and the table. But everybody, you know, uh, Melanie, Patonomy, and uh, David all grab a hold of these things and they're they're holding on to them and he closes his eyes and they go to a memory um, and that's the whole purpose of it and the first trip is to his childhood right and so they go back to his childhood and he's running through a field with his sister and this is just the whole point of this trip is to um, convince him that what this is that this is real this is not just a, a dream or a nightmare or or, or some, you know, some sort of hallucination. This is real. So they take him back to a real memory of a pleasant thing and not doing any real work yet. So then they move on to a room and they they go, they, they go to, um, his, his childhood bedroom and he's in the bedroom and he's, uh, laying there and his dad is there and, and his dad is reading a book. And he says, "Why can't I see his face?" Well, just open your eyes and look up at him, and you're in the, you're in your memory. I mean, you can look up at him from your perspective and see his face. And his dad is reading a book, and um, this is like the worst child children's book in the world. The book is called "The Angriest Boy." Okay, and this 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 whole boy. I mean, you know, mom dies in this in this in this. Okay, this is actually a pretty horrible book to read to like an eight nine year old kid. You know. So anyway, then they cut to uh, you know, you know, strange things start to happen in in this already. But uh, they cut to Doctor Poole. They go to where uh, his therapist that he had in. Uh, the the outside world or you know the non mutant world, and Doctor Poole was you know, probably a pretty good therapist, really. I mean, they made some progress uh, as far as that's concerned. And you know, medication, of course, to silence the voices, which were actually telepathic abilities, because he wouldn't know how to deal with that. Um, and then there, you know the, that kitchen scene from the first episode, uh, yeah, that crops up again to a certain extent. Um, and then they cut to his, I mean, this is all in this memory work here. Um, they 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 cut, you know, to uh, 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 his friend Lenny, the one, the girl that died in the wall. Uh, apparently, he's known Lenny for a while. Uh, Lenny has been somebody that was been in his life before, or you know, before he went into the hospital because he spent like six years in the hospital. But you know, he goes, uh, you, know, you know, Lenny is a friend he had. I don't know why Lenny's in there too, you know. And so Lenny has uh, is sitting on top of a stove on a four wheel dolly, uh, and you know then all of a sudden he wakes he wakes up and uh, and uh, patom patomony patom patonomy patonomy I'm gonna have to really practice that name because that is just a out out there name for me, um, you know, and, and you know you know he remembers um. You know, they talk about, you know, things like, you know, Patonomy gives, gives him a, a little bit of his history. And, and he talks about how he, you know, his, his dad had really horrible memory from artillery shell from a war. And I'm assuming, I'm assuming Vietnam War. And Patonomy has a perfect memory. He's like, you remember everything? Oh, yeah, I remember being born. I remember before being born, being in the womb, which... As as a Christian, I have to say that uh, they actually just gave a little, uh, you know, little, little mark there for uh, you know for for you know pro life. So, uh, and if you don't believe that, think about that. You know, so um, you can argue that out all you want. Uh, but and Batonomy asks about the book, the Angriest Boy book, and uh, you know, David denies the book, and you know. You know, so, and so, you know, that's, uh, it just says, yeah, I mean, I don't know, what book? I don't know what you're talking about, uh, kind of thing. So, um, they have a little cut scene where it shows, uh, you know, one eye dude is in the woods with a couple of guys, you know, in, in, you know, in black with guns, 
are in the woods looking for him still. So just, and I think they only did that just to show they're still being hunted. Okay. So, uh, and then we go to uh, a scene. This is actually a pretty good scene. Uh, Sid talks, it, talks to him. You know, they're, they're, it's nighttime. Um, they're sitting down talking about, uh, talking and Sid talks about the switch uh, that happened at the hospital when they kissed. Okay. And, you know, just she experienced his powers full on with no filter. I mean, even uh, even without medication, he had some ability to filter just out of self-defense that he developed over the years. Uh, you know, so uh, but she didn't have any of that, any of that ability. So she's she knew she, you know, all the sounds, all the lights, all the voices. And then, you know, and all of a sudden everything was everything, you know, the room was empty and there and it's like she put everybody into their rooms or something. Uh, through his power and she admits i mean i think i killed your friend lenny i'm so sorry you know um you know so there's there was that and so and he's like you know i think he's kind of forgiven because like you know, it's, not, it's not really your fault you didn't know what you were doing with my powers i wouldn't know what you were doing with my powers but you know he says you know geez i really want to hug you and she's like yeah i'm sorry even with gloves I, it feels feels weird to touch people like ants crawling over her skin so um, even with gloves, I mean, while she can control her switching with gloves, I mean, she still feels, you know, something trying to happen. So then we, then we, but they put, they put them into, uh, you know, I mean, cause they've done, they've done some, some work with them. And, uh, so, but they're, but his memories are, are, are different. He's fighting things with some cause, um, and first off, he's very strong, but then also the fact that he's, uh, you know, he's had such a hard life. Uh, he's hey, and he's and he's buried. I'm sure he's buried quite a few things, and he's hiding things that he's not letting them see. Uh, so they're putting him. In, they put him into a, a, an MRI. Um, near as I can figure, that's pretty much what it is. Now, one of the things, but that if you've ever been in one of those machines, first off, I'm sorry, <laughs> really sorry, because they're miserable machines. Uh, it wasn't anywhere near loud enough, and he was able to move his head around. Okay, which you just can't do. If you're going to be st- taking a picture of your head, you can't move it around. The picture gets blurry. Okay, it's just like, you know, if I move too fast on my camera here, I mean, it's, it's going to get blurry on you. And the same thing's going to happen when doing when doing these at an MRI. Uh, but whatever, fine. It's in the script. Okay, we'll give him that. So he's having memories. I mean, the whole point of being in the in the MRI is they're mapping out where his memories are at and trying to kind of trace things to make the job easier of extracting the memories to deal with, you know, what he's done and where he's been and, and, and everything and to convince him and to help him control everything. Uh, so, so we have, you know, at first I thought it was just doing, it was doing more memory work and I figured out that it was, it was memories while he's in the MRI machine. Um, so, uh, we have a little scene of of uh, of him getting uh, drugs with uh, Lenny. They traded that that oven uh, for drugs. Um, don't ask me how they swung that. I mean, you know, a used oven is worth you know fifty bucks in that particular condition. It was a piece of crud, but there it was. They uh, they they got some, they got some drugs, something called vapor, and it looks like they chose a particular drug that doesn't actually exist. At least not in my knowledge, it exists. And mind you, I haven't, I haven't been in the drug scene for, you know, well over a decade, closer to a decade and a half. Okay. Um, actually pushing the heck out of two decades, uh, since I've been in the drug scene. So there can be all kinds of things I don't know about, but to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing called vapor that you would put into a humidifier. And then it, when it vaporizes in the humidifier, they would breathe in the fumes. And that's the uh, idea of this drug, his drug of choice. So, so then he goes to his therapist. Uh, they, 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 you know, again, and they're talking and, uh, you know, for a second they go to, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of back and forth. It's like, it's kind of like a dream, uh, kind of thing where it's a little bit of back and forth. You know, he sees, he, you know, while he's talking to the, to the therapist, he sees the kitchen, okay, and then it immediately diverts to his childhood, of of you know when he was a kid, 
Now he's still in the he's still, he's still in the MRI. So the MRI is being run by a man named Kerry Loudermilk. Okay, and uh, is you know, played by Bill Irwin. Uh, he's in every episode of the first season. FYI, I don't know if that was a spoiler for you because it means you know, now you know he doesn't die. Okay, but. So he's running this thing. And one of the things that I didn't catch the first time I watched this episode uh, is that um, in around the top of his of his of the room that he's in with the monitors, there is a hamster habitat tunnel. There are acrylic tunnels. They're clear. And these this is a pretty big one. And he's got I don't know that he has he has mice in it or something. Every now and then you'll see something scampering through uh, a mouse or, or something. It's, it's small enough. I think it's a mouse. So while he's in there, you know, his, you know, doc, he's with Dr. Poole and Dr. Poole's, you know, it worked with, like I said, I, th- I think he was probably was a good therapist. So apparently his vision started at, right around the age 10 or 11 was when he really started to see, see things. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, along with uh, that horrible book that his dad would read to him, uh, his dad would sometimes wake him up and take him, uh, take him out. And they would go on a drive in the middle of the night, and his dad was an astronomer. So, uh, so what's, what's your memories of childhood? He starts, start, you know, Doctor Poole asks him that. And he starts listing off uh, these different constellations, and um, and and so, and then he says, you know, it was funny. I, I, I the stars spoke to me, and you know, my dad was my dad said they speak to me too, but I didn't realize that when he said it, he just meant metaphorically. And I actually heard them speaking to me. Uh, you know, Dr. Poole asks, you know, what, did, what were the, you know, what were they saying to you? We never get that. We don't get that out. At least, at least not in this episode and not in the others that I've seen so far. Um, so in the closet, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the therapist room, the uh, guns jar and the door goes ajar. And, it, it really, it's really freaking him out. So, you know, so it's that fear of what's in the closet thing. Um, you know, Dr. Poole gets up, says, no, there's nothing there. Yada, yada, yada. And closes it. So, um, he's still in the MRI machine, remember? And so these are all just memories. And it's like, I don't know if the, the machine was inducing the memories or what. Uh, but all of a sudden he starts hearing, uh, his, uh, his name being called. And he, and he's like, you know, he's like, you know, uh, you know who is you know who is it and and he figures out and he see, he has a he he sees his sister asking about him at clockworks at the you know the mental hospital and you know there's still work going on they're still repairing the place from when they you know he took all the doors out so he goes in and you know and he uh, his sister is there asking about him. And the, the receptionist is not warm or welcoming, for starters. And I think she probably works for Division Three. And the reason I think that is because, you know, she's, you know, she starts to get away a little, you know, starts to walk away. And then we see one eye there. Okay. Is that, was that, is that his name? I want to make sure. I've been calling him one eye. The eye. I see. The eye is there. Um... And with a couple of guys, a couple of guys with guns, and she's she doesn't think anything of that. I don't know why. I don't think she just didn't make the connection, didn't see it, or blocked out the idea that it was, they had guns. Uh, because he actually, David actually gets to the point where he can actually say, say she she hears him, which is pretty good. Um, so then, you know, David wakes up in the machine again. You know, and he comes comes to. And, you know, uh, the, uh, Dr. Carey was, uh, was kind of, you know, seeing everything that was going on with his brain. He's like, your brain's off the charts. So yeah, he's like, just, I'll be right back. And he leaves them. Okay. He's like, wait, you're leaving me? And then, uh, you know, he's, you know, he sees something and he sees, and there's the demon, the yellow eyed demon at his feet. Okay. And David freaks out, of course. And he teleports. The MRI machine outside leaves himself there. He's, he's still in the room, but he teleports the MRI machine outside. Um, you know, send, send, and, um, uh, now he, and then after that, he wants to, 
uh, you know, he, he realizes he saw his sister, and his sister has, you know, is being taken by by Division Six, or sorry, Division Three, and um, he wants to go get her, of course. Uh, you know, he's in the elevator, he's got his bag, he, and he, and he gets into the elevator, and, and Sid walks in. And she's like, "Is it because of me? You're leaving because of me? Because because we can, you know, I'll hold hands. I can do that. We can hold hands." You know, I was like, "Wow. I mean, really? No." Uh, so. So he tells her what it is, and, um, you know, Sid talks him into staying. She says, you know, do the work, stay, do the work, and, and figure out yourself so you can help her properly. And he's like, well, what if they kill her? He's like, She's like, they're not going to kill her. She's bait. They have her just to get you there. Okay, so he, you know, he throws his bag down, goes back, you know, sit, you know backs into the elevator, and, you know, they go back, and he stays. Um and then for the final scene uh, of this, uh, we saw one eye, the eye. I'll have to make sure I fix that. The eye uh, is with Amy. And, and you know, why, do, why do they have such horrible places? I mean, they did the whole thing in the gymnasium of an old school. And now they're in this horrible, horrible basement room with dripping water. And it looks like an old, you know, it looks like an an abandoned hospital or something out of a horror movie scene. Anyway, he comes in, he's carrying, you know, the eye is, he comes in, he's carrying a case. He gets the case out and it is a, is acrylic uh, fish tank kind of thing with water in it, puts it down and it's has a bunch of leeches. Yeah. It's very, very heartwarming. And uh, Amy's just kind of sitting there. She's, she's sitting there like this, holding her purse, you know, and <laughs> come on. <laughs> anyway, uh, so she, and, and he just looks in for the first time we hear the eye speak and he says, you know, shall we begin? And then over. So that was episode two. Uh, did you watch it? I hope you did because I just gave you spoilers otherwise. Um, so, uh, but did you watch it? Did you enjoy it? Uh, I know, like I said, I have, uh, I have one, uh, one viewer. I'm not going to name names unless you give me permission. Um, uh, to that said, that said, he, he, he's, he thought the first one was just too scattered and it really was, it was really was an effort to try to get that, uh, that whole, uh, backstory in there right away. And I thought it was pretty scattered. My first, and, and the, uh, the review was pretty scattered. I thought this one was better. Uh, it was also only an hour long shows this time instead of an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minute, uh, pilot episode. Uh, so, um, what did you think? Uh, let me know. I uh, I'm enjoying this show here, and uh, I'm gonna be having. I'm, I think I'm, I'm gonna be fully caught up with it by Friday. So stay tuned. There's gonna be more uh, more of these. God bless. I will talk to you tomorrow morning with uh, first word. It will be Psalm 39 tomorrow morning. God bless. <laughs>